we learn in school that everything is made of atoms. And for a while, that seems like the final answer. The world is just a giant collection of tiny, indivisible balls. But then we learn that atoms aren't the bottom floor. They have a structure. There's a nucleus in the middle and electrons whizzing around it. So the atom isn't fundamental. It's made of smaller things. Then we look at the nucleus. It's made of protons and neutrons, OK? So now the fundamental particles are protons, neutrons, and electrons. That seems like a solid foundation. You can build every single atom in the periodic table with just those three things. It's a beautifully simple picture, but science keeps asking, can we go deeper? What happens if you smash a proton? For a long time, we didn't know. But in the 1960s, scientists at giant particle accelerators did just that. They fired electrons at protons at incredible speeds. It was like throwing marbles at a bag of jello to see what's inside. If the proton were a single, solid particle, the electrons would just bounce off cleanly. But that's not what happened. They scattered in all sorts of strange ways. It was as if they were hitting tiny, hard little points inside the proton. And that's how we discovered quarks. Protons and neutrons are not fundamental. They are each made of three smaller particles called quarks. The proton is made of two up quarks and one down quark. A neutron is two down quarks and one up quark. Suddenly, the picture got even simpler. We didn't need protons and neutrons in our list of basic ingredients anymore. We just needed up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. With those three particles, you can build all the normal matter in the universe. Everything you have ever seen or touched, your body, your chair, the planet Earth, the sun. It's, all of it is just combinations of up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. This discovery was the foundation for what we now call the standard model of particle physics. It's our best current map of the fundamental particles and the forces that govern them. And uh, according to the standard model, that's it. The journey stops there. Quarks and electrons are fundamental. They are not made of anything smaller. They are true elementary particles. They are described as point-like, which means that as far as any experiment has ever been able to tell, they have no size. They have no internal structure. They are just a point in space with certain properties like mass and charge. For decades, the standard model has been fantastically successful. It has predicted the existence of particles before they were ever found. It has made calculations that match experimental results with incredible precision. It is one of the most successful scientific theories ever created. So when it says that quarks are fundamental, we have to take that very seriously. Every time we have built a bigger, more powerful particle collider, we have essentially put quarks under a more powerful microscope. But, and every single time they still look like points, we have not found any evidence of them having parts. There are no tiny gears or strings inside, just a quark. So the simple answer to the question, could quarks be made of something even smaller, is no. Uh, according to our best tested theory of physics, they are not. Case closed. But that's not a very satisfying answer, is it? It feels a bit like a dead end. And science is never really about dead ends. It's about asking what if and why. The standard model for all its success is not a complete theory of everything. It has some huge glaring holes in it. And it's in those holes that the possibility of a deeper reality begins to emerge. It's in the unanswered questions that we find the motivation to ask if quarks really are the end of the line. What are these holes? The most famous one is gravity. The standard model describes three of the four fundamental forces of nature, the strong nuclear force, which holds quarks together inside protons, the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for radioactive decay, and electromagnetism, which governs light and electricity. But it says nothing about gravity. Gravity is obviously a huge part of our universe, but it's completely left out of our best theory of particles. This is a massive clue that the standard model is not the final word. A true theory of everything would have to unite all four forces, including gravity. Then there's the problem of dark matter and dark energy. When we look out the universe at how galaxies rotate and how the universe is expanding, we find that all the stuff we can see, the stars, the planets, the gas, all the matter made of quarks and electrons only accounts for about 5% of the total mass and energy in the universe. The other 95% is a complete mystery. About 27% is something we call dark matter, which seems to be some kind of invisible particle that doesn't interact with light. The other 68% is dark energy, a mysterious force that is causing the expansion of the universe to speed up. 
The standard model has absolutely nothing to say about this other 95%. Our best map of reality is missing almost all of reality. This is another giant sign that our current understanding is incomplete, and there are other, more subtle puzzles within the standard model itself. For example, it lists all the known fundamental particles, but it doesn't explain why they have the properties they do. Why does an electron have the exact mass it has? Why is the top quark so incredibly heavy, almost as heavy as a gold atom? Now, the standard model just gives us a list of numbers that have to be measured in experiments and plugged into the equations. It doesn't explain where those numbers come from. A truly fundamental theory would hopefully explain why the universe is built this way. And there is also a strange pattern in the particle world. Quarks and electrons are part of the first generation or family of matter. But for some reason, there are two other heavier generations. There is a harm quark and a strange quark and a heavier electron-like particle called a moon. Then there is an even heavier top quark and bottom quark and a super heavy particle called a tau. These heavier particles are unstable and quickly decay into the first generation particles that make up our world. But why are there three copies? Why this repetition? The standard model doesn't explain it. It just says, that's how it is. When you see a pattern like this, it often suggests that there is an underlying structure. It's like finding three different sets of Russian nesting dolls. Um, you'd suspect they were all made from the same basic blueprint. This family problem is a strong hint that quarks and electrons might not be so fundamental after all. Maybe they are just different arrangements of some more basic building blocks. So, we have a theory that works perfectly for the 5% of the universe we understand, but it's full of mysteries and unanswered questions. This is where physicists start to dream. This is where they propose ideas that go beyond the standard model. And many of these ideas are built on the premise that quarks are not the bottom floor. They are just another layer of the onion. The most straightforward idea is that quarks are, in fact, composite particles. Just like protons are made of quarks, perhaps quarks are made of even smaller things. These hypothetical particles have been given a name prions. The idea is very appealing. Um, you could imagine a universe with just two or three types of prions, and by combining them in different ways, you could create all the quarks and all the electrons and other leptons we see. An up quark might be two of one type of prion and one of another. A down quark might be one of the first type and two of the second. An electron might be a different combination altogether. This would be a huge simplification. Instead of a dozen or so fundamental particles of matter in the standard model, we would only need a few prions. Um, it would be a beautiful and elegant solution. It could potentially explain the family problem. Maybe the second and third generations of particles are just excited states of the first generation. Just like an atom can be in a low energy ground state or a high energy excited state, maybe a muon is just an excited electron made of the same prions, but with more energy. But the prion idea has a very big problem. A huge one is related to a fundamental rule of quantum mechanics called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In simple terms, this principle says that the more you confine a particle to a small space, the more uncertain its momentum becomes. This means its momentum, and therefore its energy, must be very high. Quarks are incredibly small. We know from experiments that if they have any size at all, it's unbelievably tiny. So, if you were to cram prions inside a space that small, the uncertainty principle demands that those prions would have to be moving around with an absolutely enormous amount of energy. When you add up all that energy, a problem arises. Thanks to Einstein's famous equation, EMAC2, energy and mass are equivalent. All that energy inside the quark from the bouncing prions would contribute to its mass. And the calculated mass would be gigantic. A quark made of prions should be thousands of times heavier than the quarks we actually observe. This mass problem is a major killer for most simple prion models. It's the main reason why the idea, while appealing, is not widely accepted. Scientists have tried to find clever ways around it, but so far, no prion model has been able to solve this puzzle convincingly. Because of problems like this, many physicists have turned to a much more radical and mind-bending idea string theory. String theory proposes a completely different picture of reality. It says that the fundamental constituents of the universe are not point-like particles at all. They are not quarks, they are not electrons, and they are not prions. At the very bottom of everything, there are tiny, one-dimensional, vibrating loops of energy called strings. Uh, in this view, every particle we see is just a different manifestation of one of these strings. 
An electron is a string vibrating in one particular pattern. A quark is a string vibrating in another pattern. Is a photon, the particle of light, is a string vibrating in yet another pattern. It's a bit like a guitar string. A single string can produce many different notes depending on how it vibrates. The A note, the G note, the C note, they are all just different vibrations of the same string. In the same way, all the different particles in the universe are just different. Notes being played by these fundamental cosmic strings. This idea is incredibly powerful and elegant. For one, it solves the problem of having so many different fundamental particles. Well, they are all just different modes of the same underlying object. It also has another huge advantage, it naturally includes gravity. One of the specific vibrational patterns of a string corresponds exactly to the properties of the graviton, the hypothetical particle that carries the force of gravity. So, uh, unlike the standard model, string theory doesn't leave gravity out. It requires it. This has made it the leading candidate for a theory of everything for decades. So, in the context of string theory, are quarks made of something smaller? The answer is both yes and no. A quark isn't made of smaller particles in the way a house is made of bricks, it's more like a wave in the ocean. The wave is not made of smaller things, it is a certain behavior of the underlying ocean. Similarly, a quark is a certain behavior, a specific vibration of an underlying string. So, in that sense, the string is more fundamental than the quark. However, string theory comes with its own set of massive challenges. For one, it requires the universe to have more dimensions than the three of space and one of time that we experience. Most versions of the theory require a total of 10 or 11 dimensions. So where are these extra dimensions? The idea is that they are compactified or, or curled up on themselves at an incredibly small scale, so small that we can never perceive them. It's like looking at a garden hose from far away. It looks like a one-dimensional line. But if you get very close, you see it has a second dimension of the circular part you can go around. The extra dimensions of string theory are supposed to be curled up like that, but on a scale trillions of times smaller than an atom. The other major problem with string theory is that it is almost impossible to test. The strings themselves are thought to be so tiny, and the energies required to see them vibrate in their different patterns are so high that they are far beyond the reach of any particle accelerator we could dream of building. String theory has produced a vast and beautiful mathematical framework, but it has not yet made a unique testable prediction that would allow us to confirm or deny it. It has not been able to tell us why the particles have the specific masses they do, or why there are three generations. There are so many possible ways for the extra dimensions to be curled up that there are countless different versions of string theory, each describing a different possible universe. We don't know how to find the one that describes our own. Beyond prions and strings, there are other, even more exotic ideas. Some theories, like loop quantum gravity, suggest that space-time itself is not smooth and continuous, but is made of discrete, indivisible chunks. In this picture, particles like quarks might not be fundamental things at all, but rather just knots or braids in the fabric of space-time itself. The particle wouldn't be in space, it would be a feature of space, so we have these competing visions of what might lie beneath the quark. But how can we ever find out for sure? How do we test these ideas? The most direct way is to do what we've always done, smash things together with more and more energy. That's the job of particle colliders like the Large Hadron Collider LHC in Switzerland. If quarks are composite made of prions, then at a high enough energy, we might be able to break them. Or, if we can't break them, we might be able to see that they aren't perfect points. When we collide protons, we are really colliding their constituent quarks and gluons. If a quark has an internal structure, the way it scatters off another quark will be different from how a point particle would scatter. It would be less like two billiard balls hitting and more like two bags of jelly beans hitting. The debris from the collision would look different. So far, the LHC has seen no evidence of this. The quarks still look perfectly point-like. Another possibility is that a high-energy collision could bump a quark into an excited state. If it's made of prions, those prions can be rearranged into a higher energy configuration, creating a temporary, heavier version of the quark. This excited quark would then instantly decay, producing a specific shower of other particles that we could detect. Finding such a signal would be a smoking gun for quark substructure. So far, nothing. The problem is one of scale. The energies at which we expect to see evidence of prions or the effects of strings are likely immense, possibly millions of times higher than what the LHC can achieve. The reason for this is related to the size. We know quarks are extremely small. To probe something that small, you need a wave with an incredibly short wavelength. 
In quantum mechanics, a shorter wavelength means higher energy. To see inside a quark, we need an energy level that is simply beyond our current technology. We would need a particle accelerator a thousand times more powerful, or perhaps the size of our solar system. So, are we stuck? Not necessarily. We can also look for indirect evidence. Even if we can't create new particles or break quarks apart, new physics at a higher energy scale can still leave tiny, subtle footprints at the energies we can reach. Quantum mechanics allows for virtual particles to pop in and out of existence in the vacuum for fleeting moments. A heavy, undiscovered particle, or a prion, or a stringy effect, could pop into existence during a particle interaction, slightly change the outcome, and then disappear. By making extremely precise measurements of well-understood processes and comparing them to the predictions of the standard model, we can look for tiny deviations. If we find a measurement that consistently disagrees with the theory, it could be the shadow of new, deeper physics. This is a huge part of the work being done at the LHC and other experiments around the world. It's a painstaking search for a crack in the standard model's perfection. In the end, we are left in a fascinating and humbling position. We have a theory, the standard model, that works better than any theory has a right to. It tells us that quarks are fundamental points, the end of the line, and every experiment we have ever done has agreed with it. There is no direct evidence whatsoever that quarks are made of anything smaller. But at the same time, we know with almost absolute certainty that the standard model is not the final answer. Its inability to account for gravity, dark matter, dark energy, and the patterns within its own structure tells us that there must be something more. There must be a deeper reality. Whether that deeper reality involves smaller particles like prions, vibrating strings, and extra dimensions, or something else so strange we haven't even imagined it yet, we simply do not know. Um, the ideas we have now, like prions and strings, are brilliant and compelling, but they also have profound problems of their own and remain stubbornly beyond the reach of experimental verification. So could quarks be made of something even smaller? The honest answer is we don't know. Physics doesn't have a definitive answer for you. It has a very successful theory that says no, and a collection of deep, unresolved puzzles that strongly suggest my bay. It's one of the biggest open questions in all of science. It's the frontier of our knowledge about the fundamental nature of reality. The search for what lies inside a quark, if anything, is the search for the next chapter in the story of physics. And it's a story that is far from over. The fact that we can even ask this question and that we have a path to potentially answering it, however difficult, is a testament to how far we've come. The next layer of the onion is out there, waiting. Uh, we just have to figure out how to peel it.